As you probably know, a uh, multi-mode fiber doesn't preserve an image as it propagates through it. So for instance, here we've got a spot being scanned across the core of a multi-mode fiber at one end. Now that spot is made up of many different modes. All those modes have different group velocities uh, and they're all gonna undergo mode coupling along the length of the fiber due to bends, twists, etc. And what you end up with is just a speckle pattern basically at the other end. But there is a one-to-one -one relationship between the input image and its corresponding speckle pattern. So if you calibrate your multi-mode fiber appropriately, it's possible to effectively see straight through that fiber. So here's a demonstration of that principle. Here we're generating a focus spot at the output of the fiber by coupling in this mixture of amplitude phase and polarization at the other end. And then the mode mixing along the length of the fiber itself generates the focus spot at the far end. This is the principle behind multi-mode fiber imaging. And the reason you might want to do that is it enables you to use a multi-mode fiber like this hair-thin endoscope. And that's useful for imaging particularly sensitive areas of the body, like inside the solid tissue of organs such as the brain. Now, a lot of previous multi-mode imaging demonstrations have been done along the lines of the previous slides uh, using a spot type basis. So basically you calibrate the fiber to work out what you need to put in at one end to generate a focus spot at the far end. And then use that for imaging either by scanning a spot like in the previous slide and then measuring the backscattered light to interrogate the image at the far end. Or the other way you can do it is you use the spots as little pixels and you make different images projected through to the far end of the fiber by superposition of multiple different spots. The problem with using a spot basis is that a spot doesn't actually have any particular physical meaning in terms of light propagation through a multi-mode fiber. It's a convenient way of representing an image, but not a much more than that. It also turns out from an information theory point of view that a spot basis is not ideal. It doesn't maximize your number of spatial channels. It doesn't maximize your potential resolution. Now you might guess that say a square or rectangular grid of spots is not optimal either. You can get slightly better performance using concentric circles you know, fitting more with the circular geometry of the fiber. But in either case, let's say for this example here, we've got a fiber which supports 36 spatial modes. That's 36 potential spatial channels, which can be used to increase the detail of your image. Now, if we describe it using 36 spots and you do the you know, sort of necessary eigen analysis, you can find out that you're only actually really getting about half the total number of spatial channels through that fiber. Now you can oversample, have many more spots than there are spatial modes in the fiber, and that will also increase your resolution, but you'll never get to the full number of potential channels. You'll never get, so in this case, to the full 36 spatial channels. Obviously you can't put your pixels infinitely close. They start to interfere. A spot basis is not a truly orthogonal set. The natural way to describe light propagation through a multi-mode fiber is in the basis of its eigenmodes, say the typical uh, LP modes or you know the vector modes, whichever basis you choose. And the advantage of that set is that it's a truly orthogonal set. Every mode is orthogonal to every other mode. If you have a 36 mode fiber, using that basis, you get all 36 spatial channels. And this sort of spot basis versus mode basis type argument has actually already played out in a related field of mode division multiplexing in optical telecommunication. So in mode division multiplexing, each mode, each spatial channel is another channel of information which increases your capacity or information capacity of your fiber. In this case, each mode is sort of like a pixel which is used to increase your level of detail. In mode division multiplexing, that's why they've moved away from the spot-based launches to photonic lantern-based launches because it allows you to get the full number of spatial channels and maximize your capacity. The other advantage of using a mode basis is that because you keep your mathematical description of the propagation in the fiber very close to the underlying physics itself, obviously modes have an actual physical meaning, it creates a much simpler description. It creates a transfer matrix which is very sparse. I'll get, I'll get to that in a moment. 
All right, so I'm going to do imaging through a multi-mode fiber in the basis of the eigen modes themselves. First thing you need to do is describe your image in terms of the modes. This is the image we want to project to the far end of the fiber. Then you've got to characterize the multi-mode fiber, which you're going to be projecting through. And to do that, I'm using my spatial light modulator based system. It's an arbitrary mode generator at the input and the, basically the same system in reverse at the receiver, which acts as the analyzer, as the mode analyzer. I won't go into this in too much detail, but what it basically does is it launches each mode the fiber supports in each polarization one at a time at the input and then decomposes the beam at the other end using the receiver. And in that way, it measures the entire mode transfer matrix of the fiber. And this is different from traditional multi-mode fiber imaging uh, implementations, which typically have a fiber which supports many, many modes and your transfer matrix is just sort of like a subset of that. There's many fewer spots than there are modes in the fiber. In this case, we're measuring every mode the fiber supports. So the entirety of light propagation inside that fiber at that wavelength is specified by this matrix. There's no spatial channels missing. It's not oversampled, it's not undersampled. Here's an example of a mode transfer matrix for a 50 micron core graded index multi-mode fiber at 1550 nanometers. In theory, it supports 110 modes, 55 modes per polarization. In practice, the highest order mode group is cut off, so you actually end up with only 90 modes. 45 special modes per polarization. It's two meter long fiber in this case. If we look at the amplitude, or the amplitude squared of the mode transfer matrix on the left, you can see one of the advantages of using a mode based description. And that is that this matrix is very sparse. You can see there most of the power is scattered along the diagonal, telling you what you would sort of intuitively know that if you couple into say the fundamental mode, you're not going to get much power coming at the other end at the highest order mode. And you know that before you even start the measurement. So in practice, you don't actually have to measure the entire matrix. You really just need to measure those values near the diagonal, which means less measurements are needed during characterization. On the right, we've got the phase information as well. And if you multiply that matrix by its conjugate transpose, you get the identity matrix, which verifies that your propagation matrix is unitary. Uh, it's like a generalized rotation operation. Information is not lost. It's just kind of rearranged. And just how simple that matrix is becomes even clearer if you summarize it in terms of uh, the degenerate mode groups of a graded index multimode fiber, which is shown on the right. So in a graded index multimode fiber, you've got LP modes with indices LM, then all the modes that share the same value of 2M plus L have virtually identical propagation constants. So in this diagram here, all the modes in the same column have basically the same propagation constant. They're all gonna mix like crazy inside the columns, but as it turns out, they're actually pretty much isolated from all the other modes. And that's why we see this sort of identity matrix um, on the right here. And that tendency for modes to stay within their own mode group is stronger than you might suspect uh, if you'd never measured it before. On the left, we've got a two meter length of fiber. And on the right, we've got a 17.6 kilometer length of fiber. And you can see they both look very much like the identity, uh, except in the 17.6 kilometer length, the highest order mode group has actually become cut off over that distance. Okay, so we've characterized the fiber. For the first demonstration, uh, we're gonna make a particular spatial mode come out in a particular polarization at the far end of the fiber. To do that, you get the mode transfer matrix, you invert it, that'll tell you what you need to put in at the input end. You configure your SLM at the input to excite that particular required distribution of amplitude, phase, and polarization. That's what we're looking at here. And you'll excite every mode with just the right amplitude, just the right phase, and just the right polarization, then you get the mode you want. In this case, we've got a horizontally polarized LP43 mode exiting uh, after two meters. And you can do that for various different modes. And as we've seen here, we've actually got the full mode transfer matrix. We've got full spatial and polarization control. You can make different modes come out different ports of your polarizing beam splitter at the output. Get a bit more complicated. Here I've got the somewhat confusing demo of a uh, horizontally polarized vertical line and a vertically polarized horizontal line. That could have been made clearer. 
Getting a little bit fancier, you can make H come out horizontally polarized and V come out vertically polarized. And then as a bit of a treat, you can make uh, smiley face come out horizontally polarized and frowny face come out vertically polarized. It's actually worth noting that in this fiber, there's actually not quite enough spatial modes. There's only 45 spatial modes. Uh, there's not quite enough to generate a frowny face. And the joke I've been running into the ground is that not only does it take more muscles to frown than it does to smile, it also takes a superposition of more Legere Gaussian modes to frown than it does to smile. The SLM is a dynamic device, obviously, so you can also do other things like make the modes rotate in the desired polarization at the output. Uh, here's another example. We've got the same mode in two different polarizations spinning in two different directions, one twice as fast as the other. And here's another demonstration where it's actually spinning LP21 modes through 17.6 kilometers of fiber. Now, typically, most multi-mode imaging demonstrations have been done through sort of like one 10 meter lengths of fiber. Uh, so this is the longest optical mode transfer matrix inversion by probably like three orders of magnitude, I guess. And then finally, I've got the system set up such that you can type characters on the keyboard and it will print them to the far end of the fiber in the desired polarization. That's what we're looking at here. It's spitting out all 256 ASCII characters in, AS in uh, aerial font. On the left, we've got the goal. That's what you could do if you had an infinite number of modes. In the middle, we've got theoretically the best you could possibly do given the 45 spatial modes that this fiber supports. And the right, we've got what's actually observed on the camera in the lab at the output of the fiber. Thank you very much. I've shown here that using the modes themselves as the basis for imaging through multi-mode fiber allows you to get the best possible resolution for a given fiber.